Well, uh, first off, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you aren't aware, we have a, a grand prize grow kit for the one lucky person. We're going to be giving away an SK403 from Spectrum King, along with a full nutrient line for 12 weeks of flowering uh, and an aquaponic cannabis masterclass. Uh, just head over to ap420.com uh, with your email, sign up, and um, that'll just let you will allow us to let you know when we do future aquaponic cannabis events. All right. Well, let's get started. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, yes. All right, so uh, I figured we would kind of cover kind of an aquaponics 101, cover a couple of different topics that I think people um, haven't had a chance to uh, uh, really cover well uh, when it comes to um, uh, getting out there in public. I have some stuff that people frequently ask me for regularly uh, in this presentation as well. So hopefully you guys uh, enjoy this presentation. So thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Uh, some of these slides you might have seen before, some of them you might not. I tried to compile a couple of different things together for this presentation. So uh, if you've seen a slide or two before, uh, I apologize. All right, here we go. Uh, so uh, you can see here, um, this is a great example of dual root zone DWC uh, growth, uh, where the roots right, grow right through the bottom of a uh, cloth smart pot uh, inside of a plastic pot, sitting above a DWC raft that was formerly a lettuce bed. Uh, and it's a great way to convert lettuce facilities. There's a lot of people out there that are looking to convert existing vegetable facilities to hemp or cannabis, uh, and that can be a great way to adapt your facility. We have the proven honesty of aquaponics. You know, we're not spraying anything on our plants that would kill the fish. Uh, that also means that we're also not killing the, the tree frogs that happen to occasionally sneak into the system through the ventilation or whatever else. Um, so when you actually are able to find those, obviously we es escort them out. We don't want them in there. But um, the fact that um, you have them in there and they're not dying from your IPM regimen kind of really speaks to, uh, you know, how gentle your your methods are on your system and it's kind of the same uh, methodology a lot of people are looking for in the the organic realm um you guys uh, someone asked about questions in chat um you guys are more than welcome to ask questions uh, in chat and then uh, we will um uh, take them at the end of the uh, the talk here uh, hopefully uh, one of the for, at least from my talk one of the guest moderators will will help uh uh, keep track of the questions and then I'll ask them. If not, just hold your questions until uh, uh, the end of the talk and then we'll, we'll get to those. And then koi, uh, butterfly koi in particular are the best profits for aquaponic cannabis. Um, you can always sell butterfly koi at a much, much higher rate than what you bought them for. Uh, they're very easy to raise. They're very bulletproof as far as, you know, if you screw up and accidentally overdose something, as long as you're not dosing saponins or anything else particularly radical, um, you're not going to have any kind of issue as far as killing off your fish. Um, you know, koi are very tolerant of a wide range of, of water conditions, so they're a very good one. As far as resale, you know, you keep them for a year or two, you know, flip them and then buy new ones uh, and you'll get a, quite a nice little profit. Better than tilapia, unless you just want to have fish tacos and stuff and then it's a little bit of a different story. So one of the things I want to talk about is, we, you know, when you're thinking about aquaponics, aquaponics is really more like aquatic soil. Um, we have a full aquatic food web that functions very similarly to the living soil food web that I think a lot of you are already familiar with. Um, it's that same kind of um, uh, cycled mineralization where you have these uh, multiple different fungi and bacteria and other uh, players in the soil food web that are breaking down those that fish waste and other uh, things that are byproducts of other um, you know organisms in that aquaponic system. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the uh, we, we often joke about um, um, how much the organic certification in certain countries requires it to be connected to the living soil system, um, but it, it really helps uh, 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 kind of convey that same message when you talk about it as aquatic soil, because if you look at the science of it, it really truly is just like living soil, and I think living soil and aquaponics really are 
uh, very much in an alignment. And especially when you hear uh, Lorenzo talk later this afternoon uh, on the comparisons between compost and lit aquaponics and compost plus aquaponics, when they did all three of those variables and then a control uh, with just soilless medium, uh, you really can kind of see plain as day how those microbes and, and the benefit of combining those microbes, uh, even if you were just doing aquaculture tanks and taking the aquatic soil, uh, aquatic food web and applying it to your living soil beds, your hugo beds, your, your acreage of fields uh, that you guys already have for your existing field crops, you will get an enhanced microbial uh, effect on your, your food webs in your soil as well. Uh, you know, it really has an immense effect in terms of boosting uh, per, uh, yields and production. You're gonna see that later today uh, in, a, in a much more quantitative way than I'm explaining it now. So uh, this, uh, we're going to talk about a couple of uh, quick uh, aquaponic myths. Um, so fish poop does not have all that plants crave. Um, fish poop does lack certain things, uh, iron, uh, certain micronutrients, and other things like that simply aren't provided by uh, the uh, uh, fish poop th itself. Um, and that can be an issue if you uh, um, don't provide those nutrients. Um, so another uh, thing is, is that people say that you don't have to dose any nutrients. You actually absolutely have to supplement a little bit because, um, you know, there are some stuff that, again, just is not generated by the system itself. And we're working towards ways to fix that, which we'll talk about later on in the conference and this presentation, uh, as well as this conference. <laughs> Um, and then you don't need to monitor nutrients once it's balanced. You absolutely need to monitor your nutrients every week or, or every month at the very least, uh, you know, in terms of maintaining balance, because if it gets too far out of balance, you can cause a lot more uh, issues that are much harder to fix than if you're, you know, having a smaller adjustment that needs to be overcome or rebalanced. Um, Over-engineering can fix nutrient problems. Um, I've seen every manner of, of nutrient mineralization, uh, and none of them still account for the full range of micronutrients, uh, as well as some of the things that just simply get oxidized in an aquatic environment where you have to have a DO that's high enough for your plants and for your fish. There are certain things that have to be added in a chelated way or in some other uh, uh, optimized way that is uh, plant available. And we're going to talk about that and some organic solutions that you guys can actually utilize uh, if you want to get away from the, the mineral salt methodology of, of dosing, and we're going to talk about that later on in this presentation. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to be mindful of time. Uh, rock dust is all you need for nutrients. The problem with a lot of the rock dust products is they're often high in heavy metals. Uh, just keep that in mind when you're, you're looking at rock dust products. Make sure you get a full mineral test on those products. And special fish foods can provide everything that a plant needs. Um, again, we, we've had some pretty disastrous results with different farms that tried switching to that method methodology. Um, flood and drain beds and media beds really are the best way to go. Uh, Marty, I'm sure, is going to talk a little bit about this uh, uh, facility that um, he set up tomorrow afternoon uh, or tomorrow evening. Uh, this is his greenhouse. He's going to talk about the automation he's going to be setting up in it. Um, but flood and drain beds with the dual root zone pots really is the most optimal way in terms of mineralization and the least amount of uh, nutrient additions uh, that you need to have for the system uh, in addition to the fish food. Uh, it also gives you better gas exchange at the root zone, allows you to transfer plants. If you absolutely have to move the plants, you can pull them out and move them uh, if for some reason you, you have a reason to. Um, you can also easily adopt them to wicking beds or wicking bags. So if I wanted to grow root crops, I could stick those in, sim in a similar way with soil uh, and then plant those root crops at the proper depth for moisture. Uh, as you get deeper, the, it gets wetter, uh, and as you get higher uh, with a method like this, it gets drier. So it allows your, your pots to, um, you know, kind of wick up the soil if you're doing those types of crops. Things like osha root, um, taro, wasabi, uh, ginger uh, can all be grown that way. Uh, and then media beds do not have a need for MBBRs and other biological filters. Uh, the biological surface area of that lava rock in there, uh, which is often very cheap to get, uh, by the super sack is much, much higher than any, uh, uh, you know, moving media bed reactor. And it's much cheaper as well, you know, getting that and setting it up with your, your good, you know, healthy composted soil mix above it that you're already used to doing uh, is a great way to uh, set up your, uh, your grill. So 
Uh, root setup is key for um, growing aquaponics. You, you want to set up your, your plants in dual root zone aquaponics. This not only can be great for cannabis because you can have your living soil up here with all your mycorrhizae and all your wonderful terrestrial microbiomes. You have your, your aquatic uh, food web down here, your terrestrial food web up here, but you can also um, say if I wanted to grow blueberries or raspberries or some other crop that wants to have an acidic soil or a super alkaline soil or whatever else to cater to that crop, um, you can um, uh, cater that soil mix in the upper portion of the root zone and provide those, those microbes that that plant wants to make sure that plant's healthy while still maintaining 80 or 90 percent of the nutrient base off of the same aquaponic water that the rest of the plants are feeding from. And, and it really helps to kind of get the best of both worlds, even outside of cannabis. And we've grown everything from cacti to uh, fruit trees to um, cannabis to you know, all different types of things. And that's one of the other nice things too about growing medicinal crops aside from cannabis is learning how to you know, maximize different um, uh, uh, production of different essential oils and some of these other herbs really helps you, you know, take some of those methods and apply them back to cannabis. And this is one of the things that we really do a lot of experimentation with that we've had just a ton of success with. And almost all of your current commercial aquaponic cannabis producers are using uh, dual root zone uh, methodology because you can dial this soil zone into whatever feed rate that you need to without hurting the fish at all. So if you have a strain that you need to feed much heavier, you can top feed it or top water it and not have any negative impact on the rest of the system. And if you're on a small home scale, it's easy to maintain by hand. Uh, and then we have ways of uh, automating it on a large scale. So you can see here uh, this upper soil zone here uh, with the roots in the soil and then the lower soil zone here with the burlap in between with about a one inch gap at the highest flood layer uh, that allows the uh, uh, air gap because we don't want the water to wick up into the soil. We want to top water to maintain moisture up here and occasionally top feed additional nutrients as needed. Now, what we'll do is for saturation rate is we'll, before we put this pot in the system, we'll pour water into the upper soil zone and see what the saturation rate is until it just starts to drip out. We'll take that and measure it. So we'll call it 16 ounces of, of water uh, in order to fully saturate this to where it'll drip out. We're gonna cut that in half and say eight ounces. So we're never gonna water more than eight, maybe even 10 ounces at most into that upper soil zone in order to make sure we're not overwatering for the bottom, but we're gonna use fish safe nutrients just on the, you know, to be on the safe side. And using clay balls, uh, hydrogen, or um, lava rock. Lava rock is cheaper if you're doing it at a commercial scale. Uh, uh, you know, it's much more affordable. So here's a media bed only tomato. This is the first test we did uh, way back at the aquaponics source when I was working there with their lab. Um, this is the first um, media bed uh, only control and the versus the dual root zone control tomato. So this tomato here on the bottom had 44% more flower sites, 38% more fruit and fruit that was ready two weeks earlier than the media bed plant. So uh, it really goes to show how adding the microbes to the root zone really makes an enormous difference and combining the aquatic food web and soil food web truly makes plants do uh, even better than either one of those methods alone. Here's an example of uh, a Marty's Grow. Here's a nice healthy uh, uh, dual root zone uh, uh, plants here. And then some more over here on a, on a DWC. Nice and healthy plants. And then you can see here the, uh, where the water line is in the pot, just like we showed in the diagram. Fat, healthy roots. This is Bane here from Vertica, back when we used to work together at a, a different operation. And then the soil layer up above. And then the uh, huge plant that's about two months old. Um, but dual roots and media beds really give the best growth method, the best gas exchange, uh, and the fastest growth. Uh, if you, um, uh, you can do DWC, you just get a slight reduction in growth speed because you have a, a slower gas exchange. It also adds a lot of weight. So if you have large plants that you're going to grow outdoors, in aquaponics, in, in an IVC system or, or backyard system, it doesn't matter if it's cannabis or not, having that weight in the bottom keeps the plants from tipping over and windstorms and things like that, which we, you know can be quite the issue uh, when you get to um, you know larger plants, big tomatoes, big peppers, big you know fruit trees, that kind of thing. You know, they have to have some weight to anchor to or they tip over. 
Um, and again, this really gives you the ability to dial in that upper portion of the soil zone uh, exactly to whatever crop it is that you're looking for, uh, or even have a, something like a coots mix or some other time release organic soil mix that you know helps supplement you know that stuff that is missing from the fish waste. Like we talked about, fish waste is, doesn't provide everything, but you know if you already know what you're doing with your organic soil mix, just use that. You know what I mean? Like I'm not going to tell you to reteach, uh, reinvent the wheel. Use what you already know works. Just add a little extra aeration so that soil can breathe. Because what happens is in your pot, as the water goes down, it drafts fresh air through the soil. Uh, and because it acts like a, a, a vacuum diaphragm. And then when the water goes up, it pushes that old air up through the soil. So you have this diaphragm action of the air going back and forth and this breathing action in, this, in the root zone that really accelerates gro growth rate. And you can see here, here's some more dual root zone plants um, and flowers of a commercial flowering room out here in Oklahoma. There's one from Marty. Sorry, I got to skip through these a little bit quick. Um, the, uh, it's another example. This is Vertica Aquaponics. He's going to be on the commercial aquaponics cannabis panel. Um, this is, again, more dual root zone plants. These are all in roller trays, similar to how you would for uh, drain to waste. So uh, here's an example of um, uh, dual root zone. Uh, plants so we you, know, you cut a hole in the bottom. I would suggest either bracing the bottom if you're going to do larger plants or uh, just cutting four separate uh, like pizza slices out of it so the roots can grow through rather than doing this completely open. I would only do this for quicker turn plants. Um, for these bigger plants we, we did have a brace in the bottom otherwise they would just push themselves through. <laughs> Um, just be mindful of that, but it is a slightly um, a slower growth. But if you're in a colder climate, you can use, utilize that water as a thermal heat battery by heating that water. It's much cheaper with a heat exchanger or heat coils to heat that water with gas, propane, or otherwise, um, and, and then have that water heat the entire greenhouse. So if you're in Canada or Northern Europe or, or wherever else in a colder climate, that really can be a great way, or high altitude, can be a great way to help heat your facility as well. Solar heater panels uh, and solar water heaters uh, can be great for um, running those facilities uh, at very low cost. And very good for mom and clone production. You definitely see uh, a very fast growth in the DWC. It's just not quite as fast as the media bids. Here's another example of a uh, more dual root zone DWC. See, you got a couple questions I sent over in chat. Okay, yeah, just, just drop them in there and then we'll answer them here at the end. Um, this is another example of DWC uh, uh, plants here. And uh, this is again, over at Vertica Aquaponics uh, uh, here in Oklahoma. And you can see these are huge, uh, you know, 24 ounce uh, can uh, size buds all over all the, this whole row of plants. So yeah, they're doing some uh, strain testing right there. And you can see it's coming out quite nice. We have some videos of that over on my YouTube channel, Potent Phonics, if you want to check out more of their facility. We have uh, our tour of their facility. And again, he'll be on the commercial panel as well if you want to ask him questions. So the five controls of dual root zone aquaponics, you have dosing into the water. You can make a soil mix that works for you. Uh, um, you can dose nutrients directly into the soil, you can foliar spray, or you can uh, change up your fish food. Remember, the higher the protein uh, in the fish food, the higher the nitrogen. Uh, so if you're, you know, omnivores and herbivores are going to have uh, lower nitrogen or better for flour, whereas uh, carnivores and, um, you know, higher in protein feed is better for, for veg. And then again, as far as dosing dual root zones, this is the type of setup we use for commercial facilities. Uh, this is a top out uh, drain. This allows us to automatically air purge any venturi action as it goes down. Uh, and if we shut, run this on a seconds timer, this floods up, it runs for you know, a pretty exact amount of water for across all the pots as long as it's level, uh, and then uh, shuts off and immediately air breaks. Uh, back down uh, with an air break that's at the end. So it really does help us uh, do much more accurate water dosing and reduce the total amount of water that we're using uh, per grow run, even for soil facilities as well. 
Uh, and we're adapting this in quite a few different places. We originally developed this manifold style for doing vertical towers uh, and trying to you know, get to a larger diameter plumbing that wouldn't clog because we were having a ton of issues with those drip lines and other things just clogging like crazy with our vertical towers. And uh, we wanted to get away from that. So um, we, we developed this type of top out. And again, you just can plumb this to an IVC, run this to a pump with a seconds timer, you know, run it however time, however long it is that you wanted to get the volume of water you know, to not reach saturation in your water, run that for however many seconds uh, and then shut it off uh, with a taller air break at the end. There's a, a tall pipe at the end uh, that has an extra T with a loop back down just in case it overflows. Uh, but as soon as the pump turns off, it air breaks all of them almost simultaneously. And, uh, and it really helps for larger, automated larger facilities to get that really tight um, uh, amount of water uh, with a large diameter plumbing that just isn't a bunch of hassle to keep clean and, and uh, to constantly have to worry about clogging. And it really has worked really well at a bunch of different facilities that we've set it up on. But again, just like we talked about, uh, if you have the saturation rate in the upper area of the soil at 16 ounces of water, uh, and before it drips through the bottom, you're gonna cut that in half for eight ounces, or maybe even 10 ounces of water max uh, for that upper uh, watering uh, so that you don't overwater uh, your, your soil zone in the future. So uh, in aquaponics, we've seen quite a large increase in certain cannabinoid and terpene expressions across the board. Uh, you know, quite a bit of increased terpene expressions, any, as much as 300% increased terpene expression stuff going from 1%, you know, or 1.3% up into the 3 or 4% range total terpenes uh, in aquaponics versus just the uh, um, soil uh, control uh, and um, uh, all different types of other things, CB, THCV, CBDV, and CBG. Uh, we've, we've noticed quite a significant increase compared to soil controls as well. Uh, and then we've also noticed a, a huge increase in T, uh, CBD. We've had certain strains go from three or 4% CBD up into the seven or 8% CBD range in aquaponics. Um, clearly there's some type of microbial factor going on with the uh, our aquatic food web that's triggering that CBD expression. So we're gonna, apparently my cat wants to be part of this. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, but uh, uh, CBD uh, uh, clearly is a part of the, uh, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the cat's distracting me. Um, CBD, there's clearly a microbe in the aquaponics that's increasing CBD production or, or the triggering of that gene. So um, we will definitely uh, find out more about that as time goes on. Uh, THC as well, uh, we've noticed a, a slight increase. And there's some studies out of um, Canada as well, the people from Green Relief that also have shown an increase in THC and CBD production as well. Um, so here in the back, you can see a fully supplemented aquaponic uh, cannabis system where Marty had supplemented the soil uh, in the system uh, and uh, with a little bit of potassium and phosphorus. And I'm sure I'll talk a little bit about that in his talk. And in the front here, you can see where it was either unsupplemented or supplemented with just worm uh, juice. Uh, and uh, it just goes to show you can grow buds with just aquaponic water and, you know, yeah, you could smoke that, but I think most of you would rather have those plants in the back. Um, they're much bigger and much fuller uh, and uh, with just a little bit of uh, supplementation can, you know, um, have significantly better results than just fish waste alone. And I just wanted to show this because there a lot of people think you can do it with just fish waste. And um, while you, you can, you're going to have something to smoke. I, you're not going to have anywhere near as much as if you add just a little bit. Yeah, I definitely smoked it. Um, and just to clarify, uh, the the one had the same castings, uh, just without any supplement at all to the dual root zone, whereas the one in the back had both. Um, you know, minerals added to it so <clears throat> have potassium and phosphorus top dressed to the dual root zone and then was also fed worm tea um twice throughout flower so that's uh that was in the back okay thanks for clarifying mm -hmm. sorry about that no you're good well, then you can see here on the left is the supplemented flowers on the right is the unsupplemented
All right, so fish tanks, you can use all different types of things from fish tanks, everything from an old bathtub uh, to uh, 55, you know, regular plastic 55 gallon drums or aquariums, all different types of things, depending on what fits your space. You can get really big ones like that too, depending on uh, what it is that you're doing. Um, so if you're gonna do an aquarium uh, and you have a glass aquarium and you do want a hard plumb in an overflow, uh, this is how you do it. You get a glass of water, your bulkhead, your drill bit, your drill, some crafting clay. You, you trace out your, your hole where that's gonna go and where you want your water level to be. You make your little moat with the clay, you pour your water in to keep the, the hole cool. And you just gently, you know, over the course of, you know, six to 10 minutes, slowly work your way through the glass with the drill. Um, it's not as intimidating as it is. I think a lot of people think it is. Uh, you can break the glass, it's, but as long as you go low and slow, it really isn't that bad. I used to do it all the time when I worked at the pet shops many moons ago. All right, so uh, overflow boxes. So this is another way that you can plumb in your normal aquarium into your aquaponic system. That's kind of a, a lot of the theme of uh, this section is talking about how to um, connect your aquarium to your, your stuff. So overflow boxes just hang on the back of your aquarium and then plumb down into your sump. Uh, this allows you again to uh, plumb in your, your aquarium to your sump tank so that you can hook it up to your grow tent or your uh, you know existing uh, cannabis grow up. You can get them in any pet shop. Uh, one trick to get a piece of airline, like, you know, three or four feet of airline that they use for the air stones, and then run that up through here to the top of the U. And then once you fill it all up with water, put it on your aquarium, uh, this has water, some water in it, just take the end of that, slip the end up into the top of the U and then suck the end, up, uh, suck on the end of the hose and, and suck the air out. And then you can get rid of all the air out of there, just pinch it off when you're when, once you do that and you can get rid of all the air in the top of the tube and um, uh, you know create that siphon it's kind of an easy cheat way to do it and then once you got all the air out of there just pull slip the uh, the airline out of there it's the the easiest way to do it especially if you have a siphon break on you uh, here's some other examples of aquarium uh, you know style ones these are great uh, these aqua sprouts are really good for clones I have quite a few friends that'll do you know 30 24 to 36 clones in the tops of, of one of these aqua sprouts. They're really good for that. And there's some other homemade ones as well. Uh, so your sump tanks, you can use an IBC tote, you can use an aquarium, uh, you can use, you know, uh, tough totes for your sumps. And, you know, just as, as long as it takes 125% of the flooded volume of your bed. Uh, so once you have the flooded volume of your bed worked out, usually with media, uh, media displaces a, around 50% plus minus uh, of the volume of your bed. So just, you know, if it's a 75 gallon grow bed and it's filled with media, um, you know, it's about, you know, 35, 37 and a half gallons, something like that uh, worth of uh, uh, grow bed there. So, or uh, a sump tank, so you need 125% of that. So you're looking at, you know, 50 gallons ish minimum for your tough tote if you're doing something like that size. Uh, so uh, something else to think about. Wet dry filters that you already have for an aquarium can work. Um, uh, larger aquarium, you know, medium to large size aquariums can work for that as well. Uh, or even just cut down IBCs or, or full IBCs depending on what you're doing or, or even bigger things. Uh, depending on what you're doing. So this one here you, uh, at Josh's farm, D Dutch Blooms, he'll be speaking tomorrow. Um, he, he, we just put a huge pond uh, there that functioned as a sump and a uh, fish tank. Uh, you can combine them as well if you, uh, you want to. So here's kind of a, a quick system guide. You, you need to have a fish tank, grow beds, a pump, piping, valves, bulkheads, glue or hose clamps, depending on how you're going to fasten your, your plumbing, fish, fish food, fish, uh, freshwater aquarium test kit, because you're going to need to test your pH, uh, your nitrogen, uh, and a couple of other things, um, your media, your pots, your soil, and your plants.
And here's the little backyard uh, system that I built when I was staying uh, out in Colorado. You can see here, it's just a tough tote with the concrete mixing tray that we got from Home Depot. It's just a fountain pump that we set up on a timer. Uh, so it was running, you know, every 15 minutes, every hour. Uh, and then, uh, you know, some dual root zone pots for some of the more heavier feeding plants, like the tomatoes and the peppers. Uh, but you can see how heavy that's flowering already uh, on that tomato and this little aquaponic system, just a few goldfish in the bottom. So it really can be something as simple as, uh, um, you know, uh, something that tiny, you know, uh, on your porch or, or, you know, if you just want to grow a couple of veggies, you know, even if you're not doing cannabis or, hey, this is more than enough to grow one or two cannabis plants if you wanted to, uh, as long as you had quite a few fish in there. So again, an aquarium heater is really good to make sure your temperature doesn't get too cold at night. Um, and then again, a hose, bulkhead, you can get those bulkheads at any aquarium shop or, um, you know, hydro, sh hydro shop. And then a couple of dual root zone pots. Again, any uh, garden center will have all the material you need for that. Uh, and then just a little fountain pump, concrete mixing tray, tough tote, and you're good to go. Here's another system. Again, these prices were pre-virus, so I, I, had, I didn't have a time to go back and reprice it all for, for current things. But um, this is a simple little system if you're looking for a, a great little home system or educational system for your backyard uh, that you can make uh, look really nice and uh, is more than adequate um, for uh, running a whole, uh, you know, two plants at the top and then a couple of clones at the bottom, or you can run just a couple of little ones at the bottom if you wanted to, and then enough volume here at the bottom to supply both of them with flood and drain. And this is what it looks like when you build it. So we actually use these for classrooms and stuff as well. It's all made out of two by fours. Uh, and um, yeah, it works really well. Uh, you know, you can put a DWC here, grow some lettuce, have uh, one or two cannabis plants up top, uh, and then your fish down below, and it just works great. So um, as far as fish species, again, butterfly koi have the best resale value. Koi and goldfish are also just really nice to have as pets, um, but they do have the best ROI, far more than most of the food fish currently. Um, you can do uh, tilapia or other uh, food fish. I would avoid salmon um, uh, and I would avoid trout um, and striped bass or hybrid bass. They tend to be very finicky and much more sensitive to the potassium levels needed for proper flowering of your cannabis. Um, so I would avoid those in particular. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, bluegill, perch, um, and tilapia really are the best bet for food fish. Um, you know, there are a couple others that you can do, but I mean, you can't get a meat processing license still currently in the United States uh, if you are a THC grower. So just be mindful of that. So fish species, again, you have tilapia, koi, goldfish, paku, um, macostomus, perch, catfish, arapaima, arowana, sway, bluegill, sunfish, Chinese hyphen sharks, all good for aquaponics. I would not do any striped bass, salmon, trout, ornamental shrimp, edible shrimp or prawn, tropical fish or crayfish with cannabis, just because they tend to be much more sensitive to nutrients. Uh, we're going to have to speed up just a little bit to make sure we get through this. Um, basic aquaponic chemistry overview. Again, you want to aim for 6.6 .6 as your, your main uh, pH. Um, we tend to use a, a combo of calcium carbonate and potassium silicate for the best pH up results, as well as adding silica, potassium, and calcium to the system simultaneously. For iron, we really like iron humate or DTPA iron, or if you're organic certified, iron humate and iron citrate. Uh, although iron citrate is not my favorite, but, you know, if you're organic certified, then, you know, it's what you got to use. Uh, and then molybdenum and manganese are much more deficient uh, than I think people think they are normally in their aquaponic systems. Um, by boosting those, you can really increase the color and the, tea, the cannabinoid expression in your plants. Molybdenum very much increases um, your purples and your, your uh, if you got that, uh, you know, granddaddy perp or that grape ape and you want it nice and purple, you need to be adding a little extra molybdenum, especially sodium molybdenate, uh, really helps a lot with, with boosting that uh, as well. Uh, and then manganese. Manganese also, if your manganese is too low, it's going to inhibit the potential uh, THC expression 
uh, in your plant. So if you do, do that, uh, you're going to definitely have issues. So don't, uh, um, you know, don't underestimate uh, a low manganese level. It can certainly screw up your THC expression, especially in aquaponics. Um, molybdenum is also used at a much higher rate in aquaponic plants because uh, plants utilize molybdenum to convert the nitrates back to ammonium in order for the plants to utilize. So they, they burn through it faster in aquaponics and people often don't talk about that enough. Um, overdosing zinc is a great way to kill your fish. Um, and then avoid yucca or other saponine containing products. Um, they can kill fish. You know, a few drops can kill 60,000 gallons worth of, of system worth of fish. Uh, it is very, very uh, toxic. So your pH, again, you want 6.6 uh, .6 plus minus. Um, and then uh, again, it will change slightly over the course of the day. Uh, that's not a big deal. Um, you want your pH up regimen to be potassium silicate and calcium carbonate. Uh, you want your pH down. You want labs. Uh, lactobacillus can be great at a one to 1,000 ratio as a pH down. It'll drop at about 0.2% or 0.1 or a little 0.2 to 0.3 pH uh, at that dose. Be mindful of that when dosing your system. Uh, it's a good time to add a little extra pH. Uh, phosphoric acid, muriatic acid, muriatic acid for larger adjustments, phosphoric acid for smaller ones. Uh, for testing pH, you can get the electronic testers, but always keep on hand an a API test kit. I've done these thousands of times, and, and uh, they really are very accurate, as long as you get them too hot or too cold. And then it's also a great idea to keep a constant monitor running or have one that's web-connected uh, that you can um, uh, utilize. Avoid test strips. The test strips really aren't that accurate. Um, here. He's insisting on being on camera because cats are little jerks. I want to be on camera since he's insisting on being loud. Um, all right, carbonate hardness. Um, your DKH is your uh, carbonate hardness. Now, if your carbonate hardness is too low, you're going to get a, P a fluctuating pH that's going to fluctuate radically over a 24-hour period. You're also going to get a reduction in microbial replication because the, the microbes have to pull some of the carbon out of the water in order to create more biomass. So um, if your pH, or I'm sorry, your alkalinity gets too low, which is your DKH, um, below 40 parts per million uh, in particular, it really does reduce the amount of microbial replication in your system. You can easily test for this at a, you know, a couple of different cheap ways, um, uh, you know, either through Lamote if you want high accuracy or, or, you know, just something simple like the API test kit. If you want a whole master list of test kits, uh, you can find that here uh, at the address at the bottom or at the short URL at the top. I wasn't sure how long those links last, so I put the backup link there at the bottom. Uh, that is a free list available for everyone that um, is available, uh, again, um, uh, for everybody trying to do nutrient testing uh, with all of the nutrients, uh, what the, you know, uh, what range those test kits are, a link to the manufacturer uh, and the rest. So uh, definitely check that out. We have heavy metal problems. So uh, this is a, an issue. People are overdosing with kelp and um, some other, um, you know, rock dusts and things. Uh, this was a, a failed test from someone using entirely too much kelp extract uh, in their system. Uh, again, they were four times the amount of arsenic. So don't use something like a kelp with iron for your main iron input. You're going to overdose your kelp levels and way overdose your, your trace minerals. Uh, and you're going to end up with stuff like this. Their boron was also through the roof for the same reason. Um, but this is the type of stuff that you have to be careful with. Just because it's organic doesn't mean that it's safe. You have to still use it at a sane you know, and reasonable application rate. You can't just blindly do something um, just because it has organic on the label because you can still get into issues like this. And I just, it's something I wanted to bring up because I don't want people to do the wrong thing. So I'd rather you guys see something like this in the presentation than ever do it in your garden. 
Um, but this is the type of stuff that I get called out for consulting for to help figure out what that why this is. And I've also heard of some other places and other parts of the world having similar issues with kelp because some aquaponic practitioners do tell people to, um, you know, apply large amounts of kelp uh, or kelp extract or rock dust or other things. And it, you know, it can cause issues later on uh, if you have heavy metal testing. And with cannabis, we do. The lactic acid bacteria serums uh, really are one of the best things for aquaponics. Uh, the vitamin B complexes help the plants uh, grow faster, which is produced by the labs. Um, it also helps uh, eat things like pythium, E. coli, salmonella, if you have root rot, any type of root problem, especially fungal root problem, uh, they're really good for that. Um, uh, University of Kentucky State, Joe Pate was working on some lactobacillus testing over there. Uh, they found that it increased um, fish and plant growth rates by 15% or more. Uh, so that was super awesome. Um, you also have, um, uh, uh, so labs take three to five days to ferment, and we're going to talk a little bit about how they also can be a great natural way to lower your pH if you don't want to use, you know, acids and things like that. They also help break down, um, you know, fish waste in the system. You get those little pockets of fish waste and silt that makes it past the filters. They help break that stuff down, turn it back into liquid plant food. Um, so here's a bunch of different ways that you can make labs. You can either make it from uh, kefir, which is one of my favorite ways, which is lots of vitamin B. And if you're already, you know, into probiotics, you know what kefir is, but it's a it's similar to yogurt. It's a type of, of um, lactobacillus uh, bacteria that's produced, made, grown mainly on milk. Um, this is what I like to do is just dump it a couple grains into a gallon of milk, sit it on the counter for a day or two, uh, strain off the curds at the top, and I have a nice uh, uh, sack of uh, uh, labs there in the bottom. Uh, this is a, a you know, same thing in a five gallon bucket with four gallons at a time. You can also get super lactobacillus probiotic uh, at most pharmacies. Uh, say you live in a deep city and you don't have access to like a nice health food store, you can go down to the pharmacy and tell them that you just had a lot of probiotic or a lot of antibiotics lately. You need to get a lactobacillus probiotic uh, to get your gut health back and they'll give it to you. It's behind the counter at the pharmacy, but it's not a, a prescription thing. They just keep it back there in a fridge usually. You have to ask for it usually but they do keep it at most pharmacies. Um, and then uh, uh, EM1 is another great way that you can inoculate with, with a lactobacillus uh, species. So here's a, a quick recipe for that. So if you wanna uh, you know, utilize that, I know a lot of people ask me for my recipe. I, I figured we'd give that to you guys today. Um, and then uh, you guys can utilize that and do that with that what you want. Um, I'm not going to read through it just because it'll take too long and we're a little bit behind on time, but you guys have that now uh, if you want to screenshot that and use it for later. Um, we have the curds on top, the labs on the bottom, and here's some of the wonderful, you know, growth that you can get on your soil uh, uh, by dosing that and keeping it super healthy. And remember, you know, pathogens can't get in when they have that type of uh, defense force ready to take them on the moment they hit the soil. If something floats in, it's a spore. And then uh, you also have isolated plant compounds like phycocyanin. Here's the, the blue labs or super labs. That I think a lot of you guys have heard me talk about. Um, and we're working, and there's many other ways that you can utilize this, you know, doing this with aloe, doing this with many other compounds. I highly advise you guys experiment with different things and ferment them in labs the same way you do with FPJs and other things, because you will find all kinds of wonderful compounds that, that are isolated by these different microbes that are different than the stuff with traditional Korean natural farming alone with, with the FPJs. So here's an example of super labs again with the uh, uh, spirulina, kefir, and kelp. That's what it looks like when you do it right. And here's the recipe on how to make it. Um, you guys keep asking me for this recipe. I figured I would give this to you guys again uh, as part of this presentation. Um, you start off with four gallons of milk. Uh, you're gonna use about a quarter gallon of rice wash uh, for your um, yeast and labs collection. Uh, and then one pound of powdered spirulina, a quarter pound of dried kelp. Now you can double that if you want to make a strong batch and do two pounds of spirulina and half a pound of kelp. But, uh, you know, it just depends on how strong a batch you want to make. Uh, a powdered uh, uh, dried kelp versus a liquid extract is, is better. Uh, and then because we're not trying to get that, um, you know, the, some of the nasties that are in some of the extracts. Um, and then and you're going to inoculate with a seed lactobacillus, kefir grains, or your, your existing labs. 
Uh, and then you're going to let that sit for five to 14 days, depending on how long it takes. But you'll notice it, it, it'll suddenly have a, a pretty thick blue layer uh, when it finally gets ripe. It usually takes 10 to 14 days. If it's really warm, it can take as short as five to seven days. Uh, but usually it's on the longer end of that. Um, and then you'll have that beautiful blue culture. So strain off all of the curds on top uh, and then based off that blue layer. And that's your, your super labs that you can use, utilize on any injured plants, uh, any plants that are really hurting or need, you know, starting, starting off for germination or something that was recently taken as a cutting or something that got munched on by something you're trying to revive it. Something that forgot to be watered or something got screwed up with the plumbing. Um, it needs to be revived. It stuff is awesome. It'll accelerate growth rate like you nothing you've ever seen before. And it's organic. You can drink it. Uh, it won't it won't make you sick at all. It's actually good for your joints uh, and your uh, your cartilage. So, uh, and then again, that brilliant shade of blue is how you know that you did it right. And then you can utilize it foliarly in the soil or pour it directly in the aquaponic system. Um, so hopefully you guys have it uh, now as far as the recipe. Um, again, ferments, I really think, are the future. Here's an example of Marty fermenting some horsetail. Um, and again, we can utilize and unlock a ton of different nutrients by, by ferment, plant fermentation. So uh, if you're looking for what plants to, to look for for certain ferments, check out uh, the Dr. Duke's um, uh, phytoethnobotanical database. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it already, there's a link. And you can search based on the nutrients and nutrient levels and average nutrient level content for plants that might be uh, in your area that you can ferment and break down. Um, and if you are doing those tests, we'd love to have you be part of the Open Nutrient Project, um, where we are uh, kind of uh, crowdsourcing a ton of different people's uh, nutrient data based on their ferments, their compost teas, their FPJs and that are, are testing for nutrient PPMs and doing other types of tests or quantitative tests and putting them all into one centralized database so that we can say, hey, if you live in this part of the world, you can take these plants and ferment them and, or, or make them into a tea or make them into whatever natural process and utilize these methods and make a nutrient solution that is similar to uh, the things that are in a traditional parts per million um, uh, uh, type of system. So I can say, hey, I want this nutrient profile, and then we can take it and say, hey, cool, well, we can make that if you do and ferment these things. And why this is super important is things like when I was in Africa, uh, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe or or South Africa, if we could take this and have that and go pick the plants in the forest and bring them back, ferment them, they don't need to buy from the Syngentas of the world. They don't need to buy from all these companies that are screwing the whole world up and, and, and forcing them to be reliant on, on you know, monetary systems that are creating strife in some of these areas. So I think it'll you know, really not only help us as a cannabis community by working on this project, but help us be able to disseminate the similar information out to the wider world where this is, can help feed people and do things far beyond just growing cannabis. So if you're interested in participating and adding data to this database, please email us over there at opennutrientproject at gmail.com. Uh, if you're just interested in the information, we'll be putting out the first batch of information, the first report in January. Um, uh, uh, so we're simply just looking for people that are looking to uh, donate uh, data entry at the moment and uh, people are interested in participating in the data portion at this time. So thank um, And then um, one of the other things I want to mention real quick, I'm running out of time here, is that... Yeah, I was um, going to give you your 15-minute warning and you got a list of questions over here. Yeah. Uh, indigenous predatory microorganisms. Um, you want to take your traditional IMO collection, replace 30% of the rice with um, predatory... Uh, uh, insects that are attacking your garden, grasshoppers, except larger arthropods, plus insect frass. Um, mix that together, do your traditional IMO collection all the way up to an IMO2 or all the way up to an IMO4, uh, and then make that into a liquid IMO and you can start mummifying the insects in your garden uh, by you know, basically creating your own Bavaria bassiana type products. Um, uh, here's the recipe for that, uh, or one recipe for it, uh, in case you guys are interested in um, you know, trying to try that uh, as well. And again, this worked very well for us in Africa where we can collect a bunch of the ar larger arthropods and grasshoppers and put that out um, 
uh, in with the rice mixes, collect it, and then spray it because they're eating all the Cambrian layer and the, the outer center bark off the middle of the plants and they were flopping over or getting secondary infection. Um, so it really uh, um, uh, uh, helped um, with reducing the overall uh, grasshopper and locust populations in the, in the field there in Zimbabwe. But also here in Oklahoma as well. The one thing I did want to mention is be careful with your, your pollinators. Do not spray this on stuff like squash and tomatoes. If you have them flowering, it will kill your pollinators. Um, it is organic, again, but um, be mindful on what crops you're using it and the timing of when you're using it on certain crops. Again, if you something that you're looking to get pollinated, don't spray it on there. I, again, it's a wonderful product. It's a great way to help us um, make the world better by providing better agricultural pesticides, um, something that they can utilize and collect on their own their own property, something that was already present that isn't out of the normal ecosystem there. Um, but again, you have to utilize it responsibly and that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, so um, uh, you can, guys can check out, if you need nutrients for your aquaponic system, we have uh, just punch in your aquaponic uh, cannabis volume over there and uh, you can get nutrients or just buy it by the pound. We have a bunch of fish safe, low heavy metal nutrients there. If you are looking for that, people always ask me. Uh, and Marty, I also have the aquaponic cannabis class on sale this weekend on keyword code apmjclass.com. Uh, if you want to check that out, uh, we put a lot of time into that with two live sessions each month. And um, yeah, we have a lot of fun. We've had a lot of students over the years with that class and uh, it's constantly growing in content each month. And then you can find out all of my information uh, over on Potent Ponics on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, however it is that you're listening or watching this. Um, you can email me at potentponics at gmail.com. Um, my company is Potent Ponics. We do design consulting, uh, SOPs, and um, troubleshooting, and, and uh, uh, all different other types of services for the aquaponic cannabis industry. Uh, I also have APMJ Newts, uh, and I work with True Aquaponics on commercial aquaponic um, nutrient dosing and, and testing and analysis. Uh, and then you can find out more info on my website. I do have a new version of the website that'll be going up shortly instead of my old and busted version uh, that's been up for a long time. Uh, and then you can find out more of the aquaponic cannabis growers. We have a ton of helpful files over there on Facebook um, uh, as well. Uh, or our class over at apmjclass.com. So, all right, uh, let's answer some questions here. Uh, let me pull them up. All right, um, let me scroll up here. All right, Poem Pox, when is the presentation is over? How much labs do you add per gallon when watering plants? So I do a one to 1,000, so one gallon to 1,000 gallons of system volume, uh, and you can work that backwards. You can go as high as one to 800. Uh, I would be a little bit concerned about going above that because it gets quite acidic. Um, so you're gonna have some pH issues. Um, does the water need to be changed out or does it empty itself over time? You need to add more water. Um, so in aquaponic systems, we, we just top it off. The water doesn't ever get changed unless we have some kind of major issue, um, which doesn't happen very often. Does having dual root zones let you treat the water you're giving the soil as freely as a decoupled system or do you have to be pretty careful? So with, uh, with um, uh, closed loop systems like we utilize, uh, with the, most of our dual root zone systems, um, we can treat the water pretty freely uh, as long as we stay within the fish safe levels. And then anything that we need to treat above that, we simply treat into that, that top watering through the soil uh, with organic or, or inorganic, depending on the, the facility as far as top dressing. Um, does having dual root zones let you, oh, okay, sorry, same question. Uh, question on, uh, can shrimp work instead of fish? Uh, for Because of the potassium levels and some of the micronutrient levels for cannabis, we've not had any good luck with shrimp. If you are, do want to do shrimp or trout or, or salmon, that's when I would consider possibly doing a decoupled system uh, and taking that waste and doing it separately. But that would be only if you had cold water fish or you know very specific uh, fish or aquaculture um, uh, creatures that you didn't want to um, uh, negatively harm with the, the levels you need for your, your cannabis. Um, 
Let's see here. What is the health and stocking density of butterfly koi fish? Um, I don't actually know the stocking density off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. I have a calculator that I punch in all that. It tells me what I use that I built for myself. So I don't know what that is off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, aqua sprouts, question mark. Uh, it's a little aquarium uh, add-on that you can get it. Uh, that's great for clones and small plants or, or home education systems for kiddos and stuff like that. Uh, yes, uh, using ponds or fish you can use ponds and stuff like that. Just be mindful of your nutrient levels uh, and be mindful of anything that might be running off from your lawn or being sprayed that might end up in the pond that could negatively impact the fish or the plants. Um, that would be my biggest concern. It can work. Uh, just be mindful of those types of concerns. Uh, did you line the walls of the pond with a carpet or carpet padding or something like that to prevent holes? Yes, we always, always, you know, it's one great thing. You can go to most carpet stores and get old used carpet uh, and get two or three layers of that to put down below your pond liner for free. Uh, and it doesn't cost you anything. And it you know, gives you a nice you know, rock barrier. If it's a synthetic carpet, it'll be there for decades. Um, and it's a great way to have some kind of, you know, use for that material, you know, that's at least somehow constructive. Uh, what is the feed amount per square meter? Per square foot for cannabis growing. It really depends on veg or flower, uh, and then it depends on what your protein value is. There, there's quite a few variables in that question. If you uh, want to email me with, with more specifics on that, I'd be happy to answer it. But on the, um, um, as far as a quick answer on that, it's kind of a comp, I, there's more variables I would have to know to answer that question, and truthfully. Um, is starting with hard water What's the method to lower pH? If you, you have a brand new system with no um, uh, fish in it and it's not cycled yet on uh, dry ice and carbonic acid is the cheapest way to lower pH in a very large system, uh, the carbonic acid will crash out the pH and the alkalinity. And then you can just add back your pH up uh, and add some potassium and calcium back into the system that way. And, and you know, it's cheap. Just don't do it with anything living in the system. Uh, can I drain my dehumidifier into the fish tank? As long as it's not too high in zinc or copper uh, on the uh, condenser, yes. Um, I'd like to use humic acid to lower pH. I have not have a source for it uh, that isn't from Leonardite. Uh, I have never tried to use humic acid to lower pH. I'm, I'm not familiar. Um, what is the molasses? What about molasses or pH down? I don't think molasses would have much effect as far as the pH down. Is there any way to shelf stabilize labs? Yes, you can stabilize labs by cutting at 50% with um, sugar, uh, equal parts sugar. Uh, you can super saturate it with brown sugar, yes. Hopefully that's everybody's questions. Um, yeah, someone else asked about river rock. Yes, you can use river rock. Uh, 